Chapter Twelve of Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marziaus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Dickens' career as a reader reading for money commenced on the twenty ninth of April, eighteen fifty eight, while the trouble about his wife was at the thickest. And after reading in London on sixteen nights, he made a reading tour in the provinces and in Scotland and Ireland. In the following year, he read likewise. But meanwhile, which is more important to us than his readings, he was writing another book. On the 30th of April, 1859, in the first number of All the Year Round, was begun The Tale of Two Cities, a simultaneous publication in monthly parts being also commenced. Footnote. His foolish quarrel with Bradbury and Evans had necessitated the abandonment of household words. End of footnote. The Tale of Two Cities is a tale of the great French Revolution of 1793, and the two cities in question are London and Paris, London as it lay comparatively at peace in the days when George the Third was king, and Paris running blood and writhing in the fierce fire of anarchy and mob rule, a powerful book unquestionably. No doubt there is in its heat and glare a reflection from Carlyle's French Revolution, a book for which Dickens had the greatest admiration. But that need not be regarded as a demerit. Dickens is no pale copyist and adds fervor to what he borrows. His pictures of Paris and Revolution are as fine as the London scenes in Barnaby Rudge, and the interweaving of the story with public events is even better managed in the later book than in the earlier story of the Gordon riots. And the story, what does it tell? It tells of a certain Dr. Manette, who, after long years of imprisonment in the Bastille, is restored to his daughter in London, and of a young French noble, who has assumed the name of Darnay and left France in horror of the doings of his order, and who marries Dr. Manette's daughter, and of a young English barrister, able enough in his profession, but careless of personal success, and much addicted to port wine, and bearing a striking personal resemblance to the young French noble. These persons and others, being drawn to Paris by various strong inducements, Darnay is condemned to death as a ci devant noble, and the ne'er-do-well barrister, out of the great pure love he bears to Darnay's wife, succeeds in dying for him. That is the tale's bare outline, and if anyone says of the book that it is in parts melodramatic, one may fitly answer that never was any portion of the world's history such a thorough piece of melodrama as the French Revolution. With The Tale of Two Cities, Ablo K. Brown's connection with Dickens as the illustrator of his books came to an end. The sketches had been illustrated by Cruikshank, who was the great popular illustrator of the time, and it is amusing to read in the preface to the first edition of the first series, published in 1836, how the trembling young author placed himself, as it were, under the protection of the, quote, well-known individual who had frequently contributed to the success of similar undertakings, unquote. Cruikshank also illustrated Oliver Twist, and indeed, with an arrogance which unfortunately is not incompatible with genius, afterwards set up a rather preposterous claim to have been the real originator of that book, declaring that he had worked out the story in a series of etchings, and that Dickens had illustrated him, and not he, Dickens. Footnote. See his pamphlet, The Artist and the Author. The matter is fully discussed in his life by Mr. Blanchard Gerald. End of footnote. But apart from the drawings for the sketches in Oliver Twist, and the first few drawings by Seymour and two drawings by Buss in Pickwick. Footnote. Buss's illustrations were executed under great disadvantages and are bad. Those of Seymour are excellent. End of footnote. And some drawings by Cattermole in Master Humphrey's Clock, and by Samuel Palmer in the Pictures from Italy, and by various hands in the Christmas stories. Apart from these, Brown or Fizz had executed the illustrations to Dickens' novels nor with all my admiration for certain excellent qualities which his work undeniably possessed do i think that this was altogether a good thing such i know is not a popular opinion but i confess i am unable to agree with those critics who from their remarks on the recent jubilee edition of pickwick seem to think his illustrations so preeminently fine that they should be permanently associated with dickens stories the editor of that edition was, in my view, quite right in treating Brown's illustrations as practically obsolete. The value of Dickens' works is perennial, and Brown's illustrations represent the art fashion of a time only. 
so too i am unable to see any great cause to regret that crookshank's artistic connection with dickens came to an end so soon footnote i am always sorry however that crookshank did not illustrate the christmas stories end of footnote for both brown and crookshank were preeminently caricaturists and caricaturists of an old school the latter had no idea of beauty his art very great art in its way was that of grotesqueness and exaggeration he never drew a lady or gentleman in his life and though brown in my view much the lesser artist was superior in these respects to crookshank yet he too drew the most hideous pecksniffs and tom pinches and joey bees and a whole host of characters quite unreal and absurd the mischief of it is too that dickens humor will not bear caricaturing the defect of his own art as a writer is that it verges itself too often on caricature exaggeration is its bane when for instance he makes the rich alderman in the chimes eat up poor trotty vex little last tidbit of tripe we are clearly in the region of broad farce when mr panks in little dorrit so far abandons the ordinary way of mature rent collectors as to ask a respectable old accountant to give him a back in marshall sea court and leaps over his head we are obviously in a world of pantomime dickens comic effects are generally quite forced enough and should never be further forced when translated into the sister art of drawing rather if anything should they be attenuated but unfortunately exaggeration happened to be inherent in the draftsmanship of both crookshank and brown and having said this i may as well finish with the subject of the illustrations to dickens books our mutual friend was illustrated by mr marcus stone r a then a rising young artist and the son of dickens old friend frank stone here the designs fall into the opposite defect they are some of them pretty enough but they want character mr field's pictures for edwin drood are a decided improvement as to the illustrations for the later household edition they are very inferior the designs for a great many are clearly bad and the mechanical execution almost uniformly so even mr bernard's skill has had no fair chance against poor woodcutting careless engraving and inferior paper and this is the more to be regretted in that mr barnard by natural affinity of talent has to my thinking done some of the best artwork that has been done at all in connection with dickens his character sketches especially the lithographed series are admirable the jingle is a masterpiece but all are good and he even succeeds in making something pictorially acceptable of little nell and little dorrit just a year almost to a day elapsed between the conclusion of the tale of two cities and the commencement of great expectations the last chapter of the former appeared in the number of all the year round for the twenty sixth of november eighteen fifty nine and the first chapter of the latter in the number of the same periodical for the first of december eighteen sixty poor pip for such is the name of the hero of the book poor pip i think he is to be pitied certainly he lays himself open to the charge of snobbishness and is unduly ashamed of his connections but then circumstances were decidedly against him through some occult means he is removed from his natural sphere from the care of his rampageous sister and of her husband the good kind honest joe and taken up to london and brought up as a gentleman and started in chambers at bernard's inn all this is done through the instrumentality of mr jaggers a barrister in highest repute among the criminal brotherhood but pip not unnaturally thinks that his unknown benefactress is a certain miss havisham who having been bitterly wronged in her love affairs lives in eccentric fashion near his native place amid the mouldering mementos of her wedding day what is his horror when he finds that his education comfort and prospects have no more reputable foundation than the bounty of a murderous criminal called magwitch who has showered all these benefits upon him from the antipodes in return for the gift of food and a file when he magwitch was trying to escape from the hulks and pip was a little lad magwitch the transported convict comes back to england at the peril of his life to make himself known to pip and to have the pleasure of looking at that young gentleman he is again tracked by the police and caught notwithstanding pip's efforts to get him off and dies in prison pip ultimately very ultimately marries a young lady oddly brought up by the queer miss havisham and who turns out to be magwitch's daughter such as i have had occasion to say before in speaking of similar analyses such are the dry bones of the story pip's character is well drawn so is that of joe 
and Mr. Jaggers, the criminal's friend, and his clerk Wemmick are striking and full of a grim humour. Miss Havisham and her protege Estella, whom she educates to be the scourge of men, belong to what may be called the melodramatic side of Dickens' art. They take their place with Mrs. Dombey, and with Miss Dartle in David Copperfield and Miss Wade in Little Dorrit. Female characters of a fantastic and haughty type, and quite devoid, Miss Dartle and Miss Wade especially, of either verisimilitude or the milk of human kindness. Great Expectations was completed in August 1861, and the first number of Our Mutual Friend appeared in May 1864. This was an unusual interval, but the great writer's faculty of invention was beginning to lose its fresh spring and spontaneity, and besides, he had not been idle. Though writing no novel, he had been busy enough with readings, and his work on all the year round. He had also written a short but very graceful paper on Thackeray, whose death on the Christmas Eve of 1863 had greatly affected him. Footnote. See Cornhill Magazine for February 1864. End of footnote. Now, however, he again braced himself for one of his greater efforts. Scarcely, I think, as all will agree, with the old success. In our mutual friend, he is not at his best. It is a strange, complicated story that seems to have some difficulty in unraveling itself. The story of a man who pretends to be dead in order that he may, under a changed name, investigate the character and eligibility of the young woman whom an erratic father has destined to be his bride. A golden-hearted old dust contractor who hides a will that will give him all that erratic father's property and disinherit the man aforesaid, and who, to crown his virtues, pretends to be a miser in order to teach the young woman, also aforesaid, how bad it is to be mercenary, and to induce her to marry the unrecognized and seemingly penniless son. Their marriage accordingly, with the ultimate result that the bridegroom turns out to be no poor clerk but the original heir, who of course is not dead, and is the inheritor of thousands. Subsidiary groups of characters, of course, one which I think rather uninteresting, of some brand new people called the Veneerings and their acquaintances, for they have no friends, and some fine sketches of the riverside population, striking and amusing characters too, Silas Wegg, the scoundrelly vendor of songs who ferrets among the dust for wills in order to confound the good dustman, his benefactor, and the little deformed doll's dressmaker with her sot of a father, and Betty Higdon, the sturdy old woman who is determined neither in life nor death to suffer the pollution of the workhouse. Such, with more added, are the ingredients of the story. One episode, however, deserves longer comment. It is briefly this. Eugene Rayburn is a young barrister of good family and education, and of excellent abilities and address, all gifts that he has turned to no creditable purpose whatever. He falls in with a girl, Lizzie Hexham, of more than humble rank, but of great beauty and good character. She interests him, and in mere wanton carelessness, for he has certainly no idea of offering marriage, he gains her affection, neither meaning in any definite way to do anything good nor anything bad with it. There is another man who loves Lizzie, a schoolmaster who, in his dull, plodding way, has made the best of his intellect and risen in life. He naturally, and we may say properly, for no good can come of them, resents Rayburn's attentions, as does the girl's brother. Rayburn uses the superior advantages of his position to insult them in the most offensive and brutal manner, and to torture the schoolmaster, just as he has used those advantages to win the girl's heart. Whereupon, after being goaded to heart's desire for a considerable time, the schoolmaster as nearly as possible beats out Rayburn's life and commits suicide. Rayburn is rescued by Lizzie as he lies by the river bank sweltering in blood, and tended by her, and they are married and live happy ever afterwards. Now the amazing part of this story is that Dickens' sympathies throughout are with Rayburn. How this comes to be so, I confess I do not know. To me, Rayburn's conduct appears to be heartless, cruel, unmanly, and the use of his superior social position against the schoolmaster to be like a foul blow, and quite unworthy of a gentleman. Schoolmasters ought not to beat people about the head, decidedly. But if Rayburn's thoughts took a right course during convalescence, I think he may have reflected that he deserved his beating, and also that the woman whose affection he had won was a great deal too good for him. Dickens' misplaced sympathy in this particular story has, I repeat, always struck me with amazement. Usually his sympathies are so entirely right. Nothing is more common than to hear the accusation of vulgarity made against his books. 
a certain class of people seem to think most mistakenly that because he so often wrote about vulgar people uneducated people people in the lower ranks of society therefore his writing was vulgar nay more he himself vulgar too such an opinion can only be based on a strange confusion between subject and treatment there is scarcely any subject not tainted by impurity that cannot be treated with entire refinement washington irving wrote to dickens most justly of quote, that exquisite tact that enabled him to carry his reader through the various dens of vice and villainy without a breath to shock the ear or a stain to sully the robe of the most shrinking delicacy unquote. and added quote, it is a rare gift to be able to paint low life without being low and to be comic without the least taint of vulgarity unquote. this is well said and if we look for the main secret of the inherent refinement of dickens books we shall find it i think in this that he never intentionally paltered with right and wrong he would make allowance for evil would take pleasure in showing that there were streaks of lingering good in its blackness would treat it kindly gently humanly but it always stood for evil and nothing else he made no attempt by cunning jugglery to change its seeming he had no sneaking affection for it and therefore i say again his attachment to eugene Rayburn has always struck me with surprise as regards dickens own refinement I cannot perhaps do better than quote the words of Sir Arthur Helps, an excellent judge. Quote, he was very refined in his conversation, at least what I call refined, for he was one of those persons in whose society one is comfortable from the certainty that they will never say anything which can shock other people or hurt their feelings, be they ever so fastidious or sensitive. Unquote. End of chapter 12. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter Thirteen of Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marziaus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Colleen McMahon. But we are now, alas, nearing the point where the rapid of Dickens' life began to shoot its fall. The year eighteen sixty five, during which he partly wrote Our Mutual Friend, was a fatal one in his career. In the month of February, he had been very ill with an affection of the left foot, at first thought to be merely local but which really pointed to serious mischief and never afterwards wholly left him then on june ninth when returning from france where he had gone to recruit he as nearly as possible lost his life in a railway accident at staplehurst a bridge had broken in some of the carriages fell through and were smashed that in which dickens was hung down the side of the chasm of courage and presence of mind he never showed any lack they were evinced on one occasion at the readings when an alarm of fire rose they shone conspicuous here he quieted two ladies who were in the same compartment of the carriage helped to extricate them and others from their perilous position gave such help as he could to the wounded and dying probably was the means of saving the life of one man whom he was the first to hear faintly groaning under a heap of wreckage and then as he tells in the postscript to the book scrambled back into the carriage to find the crumpled manuscript of a portion of our mutual friend footnote for his own graphic account of the accident see his letters End of footnote. but even pluck is powerless to prevent a ruinous shock to the nerves though dickens had done so manfully what he had to do at the time he never fully recovered from the blow his daughter tells us how he would often quote, when travelling home from london suddenly fall into a paroxysm of fear tremble all over clutch the arms of the railway carriage large beads of perspiration standing on his face and suffer agonies of terror he had apparently no idea of our presence unquote. and mr dolby tells us also how in travelling it was often necessary for him to ward off such attacks by taking brandy dickens had been failing before only too surely and this accident like a coward's blow struck him heavily as he fell but whether failing or stricken he bated no jot of energy or courage nay rather as his health grew weaker did he redouble the pressure of his work i think there is a grandeur in the story of the last five years of his life that dwarfs even the tale of his rapid and splendid rise it reads like some antique myth of the titans defying jove's thunder there is about the man something indomitable and heroic he had as we have seen given a series of readings in eighteen fifty eight and fifty nine and he gave another in the years eighteen sixty one to eighteen sixty three successful enough in a pecuniary sense but
but through failure of business capacity on the part of the manager, entailing on the reader himself a great deal of anxiety and worry. Footnote. He computed that he had made £12,000 by the first two series of readings. End of footnote. Now, in the spring of 1866, with his left foot giving him unceasing trouble, and his nerves shattered, and his heart in an abnormal state, he accepted an offer from Monsieur's Chapel to read, quote, in England, Ireland, Scotland, and Paris, unquote, for £1,500 and the payment of all expenses, and then to give 42 more readings for £2,500. Mr. Dolby, who accompanied Dickens as business manager in this and the remaining tours, has told their story in an interesting volume. Footnote. Charles Dickens as I Knew Him by George Dolby. Miss Dickens considers this, quote, the best and truest picture of her father yet written, unquote. End of footnote. Of course, the wear was immense. The readings themselves involved enormous fatigue to one who so identified himself with what he read, and whose whole being seemed to vibrate not only with the emotions of the characters in his stories, but of the audience. Then there was the weariness of long railway journeys in all seasons and weathers, journeys that at first must have been rendered doubly tedious, as he could not bear to travel by express trains. Yet, notwithstanding failure of strength, notwithstanding fatigue, his native gaiety and good spirits smile like a gleam of winter sunlight over the narrative. As he had been the brightest and most genial of companions in the old holiday days when strolling about the country with his actor troupe, so now he was occasionally as frolic as a boy, dancing a hornpipe in the train for the amusement of his companions, compounding bowls of punch in which he shared but sparingly, for he was really convivial only an idea, and always considerate and kindly towards his companions and dependents, and mingled pathetically with all this are confessions of pain, weariness, illness, faintness, sleeplessness, internal bleeding, all bravely born and never for an instant suffered to interfere with any business arrangement. But if the strain of the readings was too heavy here at home, what was it likely to be during a winter in America? Nevertheless, he determined, against all remonstrances, to go thither. It would almost seem as if he felt that the day of his life was waning, and that it was his duty to gather in a golden harvest for those he loved ere the night came on. So he sailed for Boston once more on the 9th of November, 1867. The Americans, it must be said, behaved nobly. All the old grudges connected with the American notes and Martin Chuzzlewit sank into oblivion. The reception was everywhere enthusiastic, the success of the readings immense. Again and again people waited all night, amid the rigors of an almost arctic winter, in order to secure an opportunity of purchasing tickets as soon as the ticket office opened. There were enormous and intelligent audiences at Boston, New York, Washington, Philadelphia, everywhere. The sum which Dickens realized by the tour amounted to the splendid total of nearly 19,000 pounds. Nor in this money triumph did he fail to excite his usual charm of personal fascination, though the public affection and admiration were manifested in forms less objectionable and offensive than of old. On his birthday, the 7th of February, 1868, he says, quote, I couldn't help laughing at myself. It was observed so much as though I were a little boy. Unquote. Flowers, garlands were set about his room, there were presents on his dinner table, and in the evening the hall where he read was decorated by kindly unknown hands. Of public and private entertainment, he might have had just as much as he chose. But to this medal there was a terrible reverse. Traveling from New York to Boston just before Christmas, he took a most disastrous cold which never left him so long as he remained in the country. He was constantly faint. He ate scarcely anything. He slept very little. Latterly, he was so lame as scarcely to be able to walk. Again and again it seemed impossible that he should fulfill his night's engagement. He was constantly so exhausted at the conclusion of the reading that he had to lie down for twenty minutes or half an hour, quote, before he could undergo the fatigue even of dressing, unquote. Mr. Dolby lived in daily fear, lest he should break down altogether. Quote, I used to steal into his room, he says, at all hours of the night and early morning, to see if he were awake or in want of anything, always though to find him wide awake and as cheerful and jovial as circumstances would admit, never in the least complaining, and only reproaching me for not taking my night's rest, Unquote. Quote, only a man of iron will could have accomplished what he did. 
unquote, says Mr. Fields, who knew him well and saw him often during the tour. In the first week of May, 1868, Dickens was back in England, and soon again in the thick of his work and play. Mr. Wills, the sub-editor of All the Year Round, had met with an accident. Dickens supplied his place. Chauncey Hare Townshend had asked him to edit a chaotic mass of religious lucubrations. He toilfully edited them. Then, with the autumn, the readings began again, for it marks the indomitable energy of the man that even amid the terrible physical trials incident to his tour in America, he had agreed with Messrs. Chapel for a sum of £8,000 to give 100 more readings after his return. So, in October, the old work began again, and he was here, there, and everywhere, now reading at Manchester and Liverpool, now at Edinburgh and Glasgow, anon coming back to read fitfully in London, and then off again to Ireland or the west of England. Nor is it necessary to say that he spared himself not one whit. In order to give novelty to these readings, which were to be positively the last, he had laboriously got up the scene of Nancy's murder in Oliver Twist, and persisted in giving it night after night, though of all his readings it was the one that exhausted him most terribly. Footnote. Mr. Dolby remonstrated on this, and it was in connection with a very slight show of temper on the occasion that he says, quote, In all my experiences with the chief, that was the only time I ever heard him address angry words to anyone. Unquote. End of footnote. But of course this could not last. The pain in his foot, quote, was always recurring at inconvenient and unexpected moments, unquote, says Mr. Dolby, and occasionally the American cold came back too. In February, in London, the foot was worse than it had ever been, so bad that Sir Henry Thompson and Mr. Beard, his medical adviser, compelled him to postpone a reading. At Edinburgh, a few days afterwards, Mr. Syme, the eminent surgeon, strongly recommended perfect rest. Still, he battled on, but, quote, with great personal suffering such as few men could have endured, unquote. Sleeplessness was on him, too, and still he fought on, determined, if it were physically possible to fulfill his engagement with Monsieur's chapel and complete the hundred nights. But it was not to be. Symptoms set in that pointed alarmingly towards paralysis of the left side. At Preston, on the 22nd of April, Mr. Beard, who had come post-haste from London, put a stop to the readings, and afterwards decided, in consultation with Sir Thomas Watson, that they ought to be suspended entirely for the time, and never resumed in connection with any railway travelling. Even this, however, was not quite the end, for a summer of comparative rest, or what Dickens considered rest, seemed so far to have set him up that he gave a final series of twelve readings in London, between the 11th of January and 15th of March, 1870, thus bringing to its real conclusion an enterprise by which, at whatever cost to himself, he had made a sum of about £45,000. Meanwhile, in the autumn of 1869, he had gone back to the old work and was writing a novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. It is a good novel, unquestionably. Without going so far as Longfellow, who had doubts whether it was not the most beautiful of all Dickens' works, one may admit that there is about it a singular freshness and no sign at all of mental decay. As for the mystery, I do not think that need baffle us altogether. But then I see no particular reason to believe that Dickens had wished to baffle us, or specially to rival Edgar Allan Poe or Mr. Wilkie Collins in the construction of criminal puzzles. Even though only half the case is presented to us and the book remains forever unfinished, we need have, I think, no difficulty in working out its conclusion. The course pursued by Mr. Jasper, lay presenter of the cathedral at Cloisterham, is really too suspicious. No intelligent British jury, seeing the facts as they are presented to us, the readers, could for a moment think of acquitting him of the murder of his nephew, Edwin Drood. Take those facts seriatim. First, we have the motive. He is passionately in love with the girl to whom his nephew is engaged. Then we have a terrible coil of compromising circumstances. His extravagant profession of devotion to his nephew. His attempts to establish a hidden influence over the girl's mind to his nephew's detriment and his own advantage. His gropings amid the dark recesses of the cathedral and inquiries into the action of quicklime. His endeavors to foment a quarrel between Edwin Drood and a fiery young gentleman from Ceylon on the night of the murder, and his undoubted doctoring of the latter's drink. Then, after the murder, how damaging is his conduct? 
he falls into a kind of fit on discovering that his nephew's engagement had been broken off which he might well do if his crime turned out to be not only a crime but also a blunder and his conduct to the girl is to say the least of it strange nor will his character help him he frequents the opium dens of the east end of london guilty guilty most certainly guilty there is nothing to be said in arrest of judgment let the judge put on the black cap and jasper be devoted to his merited doom such was the story that dickens was unravelling in the spring and early summer of eighteen seventy and fortune smiled upon it he had sold the copyright for the large sum of seventy five hundred pounds and a half share of the profits after a sale of twenty five thousand copies plus one thousand pounds for the advance sheets sent to america and the sale was more than answering his expectations nor did prosperity look favorably on the book alone it also in one sense showered benefits on the author he was worth as the evidence of the probate court was to show only too soon a sum of over eighty thousand pounds he was happy in his children he was universally loved honored courted troops of friends though alas death had made havoc among the oldest were still his never had man exhibited less inclination to pay fawning court to greatness and social rank yet when the queen expressed a desire to see him as she did in march eighteen seventy he felt not only pride but a gentleman's pleasure in acceding to her wish and came away charmed from a long chatting interview but while prosperity was smiling thus the shadows of his day of life were lengthening lengthening and the night was at hand on wednesday june eighth he seemed in excellent spirits worked all the morning in the chalet as was his wont returned to the house for lunch and a cigar and then being anxious to get on with edwin drood went back to his desk once more footnote the chalet since sold and removed stood at the edge of a kind of wilderness which is separated from gad's hill place by the high road a tunnel constructed by dickens connects the wilderness and the garden of the house close to the road in the wilderness and fronting the house are two fine cedars End of footnote. the weather was superb all round the landscape lay in fullest beauty of leafage and flower and the air rang musically with the song of birds what were his thoughts that summer day as he sat there at his work writing many years before he had asked whether quote, the subtle liquor of the blood may not perceive by properties within itself when danger is imminent and so run cold and dull unquote. did any such monitor within one wonders warn him at all that the hand of death was uplifted to strike and that its shadow lay upon him judging from the words that fell from his pen that day we might almost think that it was so we might almost go further and guess with what hopes and fears he looked into the darkness beyond never at any time does he appear to have been greatly troubled by speculative doubt there is no evidence in his life no evidence in his letters no evidence in his books that he had ever seen any cause to question the truth of the reply which christianity gives to the world old problems of man's origin and destiny for abstract speculation he had not the slightest turn or taste in no single one of his characters does he exhibit any fierce mental struggle as between truth and error all that side of human experience with its anguish of battle its despairs and its triumphs seems to have been unknown to him perhaps he had the stronger grasp of other matters in consequence who knows but the fact remains with a trust quite simple and untroubled he held through life to the faith of christ when his children were little he had written prayers for them had put the bible into simpler language for their use in his will dated may twelfth eighteen sixty nine he had said quote, i commit my soul to the mercy of god through our lord and saviour jesus christ and i exhort my dear children humbly to try to guide themselves by the broad teaching of the new testament in its broad spirit and to put no faith in any man's narrow construction of its letter here or there unquote and now on this last day of his life in probably the last letter that left his pen he wrote to one who had objected to some passage in edwin drood as irreverent quote, i have always striven in my writings to express veneration for the life and lessons of our saviour because i feel it unquote. and with a significance of which i have said he may himself have been dimly half conscious among the last words of his unfinished story written that very afternoon are words that tell of glorious summer sunshine transfiguring the city of his imagination 
and of the changing lights and the song of birds and the incense from garden and meadow that quote, penetrate into the cathedral of cloisterham subdue its earthly odor and preach the resurrection and the life unquote. for now the end had come when he went into dinner miss hogarth noticed that he looked very ill and wished at once to send for a doctor but he refused struggled for a short space against the impending fit and tried to talk at last very incoherently then when urged to go up to his bed he rose and almost immediately slid from her supporting arm and fell on the floor nor did consciousness return he passed from the unrest of life into the peace of eternity on the following day, June ninth, eighteen seventy, at ten minutes past six in the evening. And now he lies in Westminster Abbey, among the men who have most helped by deed or thought to make this England of ours what it is. Dean Stanley only gave effect to the national voice when he assigned to him that place of sepulture. The most popular and in most respects the greatest novelist of his time the lord over the laughter and tears of a whole generation the writer in his own field of fiction whose like we shall probably not see again for many a long long year if ever where could he be laid more fittingly for his last long sleep than in the hallowed resting place which the country sets apart for the most honored of her children so he lies there among his peers in the southern transept close beside him sleep dr johnson the puissant literary autocrat of his own time and Garrick, who was that time's greatest actor, and Handel, who may fittingly claim to have been one of the mightiest musicians of all time. There sleeps, too, after the fitful fever of his troubled life, the witty, the eloquent Sheridan. In close proximity rests Macaulay, the artist, historian, and essayist. Within the radius of a few yards lies all that will ever die of Chaucer, who five hundred years ago sounded the spring note of English literature, and gave to all after time the best, brightest glimpse into medieval England, and all that is mortal also of Spencer, of the honeyed verse, and of Beaumont, who had caught an echo of Shakespeare's sweetness, if not his power, and of sturdy Ben Jonson, held in his own day a not unworthy rival of Shakespeare's self, and of glorious and most masculine John Dryden. From his monument Shakespeare looks upon the place with his kindly eyes, and Addison too, and Goldsmith, and one can almost imagine a smile of fellowship upon the marble faces of those later dead burns coleridge southey and thackeray nor in that great place of the dead does dickens enjoy cold barren honor alone nearly seventeen years have gone by since he was laid there yes nearly seventeen years though it seems only yesterday that i was listening to the funeral sermon in which dean stanley spoke of the simple and sufficient faith in which he had lived and died but though seventeen years have gone by, yet are outward signs not wanting of the peculiar love that clings to him still. As I strolled through the abbey this last Christmas Eve, I found his grave, and his grave alone, made gay with the season's hollies. Lord, keep my memory green, in another sense that he used the words, that prayer is answered. And of the future, what shall we say? His fame had a brilliant day while he lived. It has a brilliant day now will it fade into twilight without even an afterglow will it pass altogether into the night of oblivion i cannot think so the vitality of dickens works is singularly great they are all a throb as it were with hot human blood they are popular in the highest sense because their appeal is universal to the uneducated as well as the educated the humor is superb and most of it so far as one can judge of no ephemeral kind the pathos is more questionable but that, too, at its simplest and best, and especially when the humor is shot with it, is worthy of a better epithet than excellent. It is supremely touching. Imagination, fancy, wit, eloquence, the keenest observation, the most strenuous endeavor to reach the highest artistic excellence, the largest kindliness, all these he brought to his life work. And that work, as I think, will live, I had almost dared to prophesy forever. Of course, fashions change. Of course, no writer of fiction, writing for his own little day, can permanently meet the needs of all aftertimes. Some loss of immediate vital interest is inevitable. Nevertheless, in Dickens' case, all will not die. Half a century, a century hence, he will still be read, not perhaps as he was read when his words flashed upon the world in their first glory and freshness, nor as he is read now in the noon of his fame 
but he will be read much more than we read the novelists of the last century be read as much shall i say as we still read scott and so long as he is read there will be one gentle and humanizing influence the more at work among men end of chapter thirteen end of life of charles dickens by frank marciales recording by colleen mcmahon